What's up, my beautiful, glorious Dream Fasters? It is Danny Gallows, of course. Who'd you think it was? And welcome back to the next installment in my episode by episode review of Age of Resistance. So, today, we're going to be discussing episode 7 Time to Make My Move. So this episode begins with our heroes now arriving at their destination outside of the Circle of the Suns, which is in reality a massive stone tower rising into the air. And there's two problems now. One, it's a massive stone tower rising into the air, how are they going to climb it? And two, at the last minute they notice that a massive sandstorm is coming up behind them. But thankfully, our boy Lore is there to save the day once again. And I love this scene so much because not only does it display Lore's full abilities, being so strong and so brave, and also knowing what to do, knowing exactly what to do in that moment, grabbing everybody and hurling up the wall. So not only does it display Lore's awesome abilities, but, you know, a lot of people tend to forget that Lore basically saved the entire resistance in that one moment. I mean, you guys gotta think about it. Rian, Deet, Hup, Brea, they are the core members of the Resistance. If Lore hadn't done that, if he hadn't saved them all in that moment and brought them safely to the top of the Circle of the Suns, their entire Resistance would have been lost. Maybe it would have survived for a moment because you had the Gelfling starting to rebel. So maybe it would have survived for a moment but not that long, not without the core members. So once again, Lore literally saves the day, and again, it cements why he's one of our favorite characters in Dark Crystal history. Now, as we reach the top of the Circle of the Suns, we are introduced to another one of the greatest characters in Dark Crystal mythology, Skekra the Conqueror. Or maybe I should say Skekra the Eccentric because he's no longer the evil person that he used to be. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Skekra at all, you will know that he once used to be a very, very evil warlord. That is, before he received a vision from Thra uh, and went to go seek out his counterpart, Ergo, who we're going to meet in a minute. But I just love Skekra so much. He's always been one of my favorite Skeksis. And Andy Sandberg, man, he just does such a fantastic job. I mean, he, the voice that he creates for the character, plus his comedic timing, is just so great. It's so amazing, and it fits so perfectly with who Skekra is now, uh, being this kind of a, a eccentric heretic. Um, and, and it's great, man. Andy Samberg was the perfect voice casting for this role. It adds so much to the role, and it really brings Skekra fully to life. And speaking of brilliant voices, here comes Ergo the Wanderer, another one of the best new characters in the Dark Crystal universe. And oh man, I, I just love Ergo's introduction. It was so great and daring in a lot of ways too, right? Because we see him up in his chamber and he's just sitting up there smoking a fat bowl, you know, contemplating the universe. I'm sure that's what he's doing, right? He's, uh, he's contemplating the universe, definitely. Definitely contemplating the universe. And unlike in the Tolkien universe where they specified that, you know, pipeweed was tobacco, I don't think that's the case here in uh, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. What do you guys think about that, by the way? Because I'm pretty sure the way it's depicted, and you guys will know what I'm talking about, you know, in Brea's book and everything, the way it's depicted, I'm pretty sure it's some form of cannabis, or like Thra's version of cannabis, which is really cool, you know. And of course, Ergo is voiced by the brilliant Bill Hader, who just does, again, another fantastic job. You know, Andy Sandberg and Bill Hader were quite possibly, you know, perfect voices. It was just the perfect voice casting for this role. And I don't know how Bill Hader is even producing this voice. He's got like this deep stoner voice, which is perfect for the character, but I've never heard Bill Hader produce a voice like that before, and it's almost hard to believe it's him. But that's what makes it so great. And, you know, I love their interactions together. You know, from the very moment we first see them, from the very moment they start talking and interacting, it is so unbelievably funny. And I didn't know that you could pull that kind of comedy out of Skeksis, who are supposed to be just these kind of evil, weird lizards, and then the mystics, which are very kind of slow and, um, you know, methodical and knowledgeable and wise and kind of like, you know, just very, very kind of easygoing guys that you don't think would, you know, go towards comedy too much, that would identify with comedy too much, but here they are having these great interactions together. It's just so amazing. 
Come on, just say it. Just say it, man. Get it out there. Your name is Ergo the Wanderer. Just say it. So as Skekra and Ergo go to prepare for their highly anticipated show, we return to the catacombs beneath the Crystal Castle. And here we see that Skekso the Emperor has taken the general down here to meet with the collection of Aratham, or the Ascendancy as they call themselves. And the Emperor's goal in this moment is to offer them aid in the form of returning them to their original homeland, which was the Caves of Grot. A lot of you guys probably don't know that, but yes, the Arathams' original homeland was the entire Caves of Grot before they were banished to the catacombs beneath the Crystal Castle. So all they have to do in order to return to their homeland is agree to capture Gelfling for uh, the, the Skeksis Lords. And, you know, any of you guys who are fans of Labyrinth, will know why we all, as Jim Henson fans, love this scene so much. Because, obviously, it reminds us of the Helping Hands, that famous Helping Hands sequence in Labyrinth, which, which was so genius, so great. And here, now again, in the Thra universe, in the Dark Crystal universe, we have that connection. It's like a little connection to the Labyrinth universe, how like Thra and the Labyrinth universe are connected now just by inserting this scene into the movie. Instead of with, doing it with hands, now they're doing it with, you know, collections of spider legs forming hands and eyes and mouths and everything. And I just love it. It was so fantastic. It was so great to see that because, you know, again, I talk about this in every video, the imagination of the Henson Company, right? To use, to, to see those Aratham legs and say, hey, you know what? We can do a helping hand sequence in this movie. It's just such a great callback to the Labyrinth universe. It's a nice little connection. It's totally Henson. It's something that we, we as fans are expecting to see. And when we do see it play out, it's just so wonderful. It's awesome. However, as we soon find out in the following scene, it's a trap. Admiral Akbar would be pleased with Skekso in this moment. It's a total trap because, if you guys all remember, the Caves of Grot are infected with the Darkening. So when the Arathim move back in there, it's essentially going to be their grave. So either way, Skekso wins, being the evil-natured man that he is. Um, totally Skekso, definitely. Um, and also, this is where Skekso shows the general the Darkening rising from the Earth. And not only is it spreading faster and faster throughout the land as this purple, dark, evil energy that's just kind of killing and infecting the entire planet of Thra, but Skekso also explains to him that he's discovered a way to control it. He can take the darkening from the earth and imbue it into his crystal staff, and when the time comes, he's going to use it, possibly as a weapon, against the Gelfling. Right? I mean, anybody who's seen the show knows the answer to that, but right now we're just kind of, you know, speculating, you know, what's, what is it? It's, real, it's a really fascinating concept when you think about it, that, you know, not only is this evil, malicious energy able to take a physical form that seems to be alive and almost conscious in a lot of ways, but the Emperor can also use this special crystal that he's got in his staff and actually take the darkening and put it into his crystal. And then somehow he's able to direct that energy and use that energy as a, as a weapon. I mean, it's just a fascinating concept. Oh, and by the way, for all of you Seafin Charms fans out there, my Dark Crystal book series, using the darkening as a weapon is a concept that uh, I'm starting to play around with too. Wink. Ah. And finally, at long last, we return to the Circle of the Suns to see Skekra and Ergo's magical, powerful, unbelievably amazing performance. Now, I could talk about this sequence for hours, but I'm not going to. Uh, no, maybe I will someday. Maybe I will make a separate video all about this performance, but for now, I will just say that I think that that sequence, the puppet show sequence, which has become kind of famous now in the Dark Crystal community, uh, because most people have seen that scene, even people who aren't necessarily fans of the show have watched that scene and experienced that scene, and I think that it is the greatest, most brilliant puppet performance ever executed or composed on screen. There's a lot of, you know, great first-time puppet things being done here in Age of Resistance, and it's part of what makes the show so great. I mean, you know, the amount of magic that is radiating from that performance 
is almost too much to handle. The fact that that was actually thought up, that somebody imagined that, that they put that together, that they had the idea to use finger puppets, you know, in that sequence, adding so many layers of, um, you know, just, j just mystical kind of energy, I guess you could say, to the performance, and pure magic to the performance, that it's just so great to witness. I mean, I remember watching that sequence, even again when I was re-watching it, it must have been like, you know, the hundredth time I've seen that performance, and every single time it's on, you just quiet yourself and sit forward in your seat like an excited little kid watching a puppet show back when you were six years old. It takes you right back to your childhood and it just, it makes you feel so wonderful because what you're experiencing is just the most brilliant thing I've ever seen when it comes to puppets. I mean, it really is. Not only is it a meta on top of a meta, but we also get a beautiful history of Thra, the Gelfling, the visions of Ergo and Skekra, and also a full explanation of what the dual glaive is and how important it is to the Gelfling and what it means really to the future of Thra. And all of this is done with finger puppets on this homemade set with cloth and stained glass and smoke and lights and little figurines. I mean, it is the most incredible thing I have ever seen. It's, it's captivating, it's brilliant, it's moving, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's magical. Whatever mystical term you want to use, everything is in that one performance. Everything. And it is everything. Why did you cancel this show? And this scene also provides us with the promises being presented by the core members of the Resistance, right? Um, because they now fully realize that they are all here for a specific purpose. They all have a part to play, no pun intended, or maybe so, but they all have an important role to play in the Resistance, right? Again, these are the core members of the Resistance. This is the heart of the Resistance. So, Rianne promises that he will wield the dual glaive. Brea promises to unite everybody. Deet promises to make them one again. And it just solidifies everything. Now it's time for them to go out, ignite the fires of resistance, and start this thing, start this battle to reclaim their world. But first, now they gotta go find the dual glaive. Road trip! So at this point, we return to Stone in the Wood, where we find Madra Farah preparing to attack the Crystal Castle with ferocity. She's gathering all their troops, and she's preparing a full-on assault. That is, until Mother Agra stops by and tries to convince her otherwise, because, you know, Madra Farah, of course, is a very strong, proud, independent warrior. And she thinks, obviously, she knows what's best for her clan. But what she's forgetting is that Mother Agra has already foreseen the extinction of the Gelfling. So when she comes back, she's not necessarily trying to warn her against battle. She's trying to warn her that, look, you know, I've seen these things. The Gelfling go extinct. You're supposed to be surviving, not fighting. If you go to fight, you're just going to kill more people quick. You're supposed to be running and hiding and surviving to make sure that you can get yourself out of this situation. But of course, as we all know, Mother Farah is not going to agree with this. Mother Agra, Mother Agra storms off and Farah prepares for battle. And it's a very, very important scene because as we see, you know, even, the Gelfling will even turn against Mother Agra in a situation like that where, I mean, deep down Farah knows, she knows that Mother Agra is right, but her warrior spirit refuses to let her believe these things, and she knows, as she thinks she knows what's best for her clan. It's a very, very important scene because, now, as we see, it doesn't turn out too well. Now, back at the Circle of the Suns as our group is preparing to leave, uh-oh, the Skeksis. Boom! Skekmal comes crashing through the ceiling because we tend to forget, yes, yeah, Skekmal is still on this hunt. He's still hot on Rian's tail trying to c collect his prize, and he's never going to let it go. Skekmal is kind of like a ring wraith, right? It's like he will never stop hunting you, and that's part of the reason why I love his character so much is nothing stops this dude. This dude is an unstoppable Skeksis force, and I love it. We've never seen the Skeksis like this before, these powerful warriors. Nick Kellington just knocking it out of the park with his physical performances. I mean, just so fantastic. But thankfully, 
Archer has been on Skekmal's tail. Unfortunately, he arrives too late to save poor Hup, poor brave Hup, who just gets blasted back uh, to who knows where. He goes through some curtains, he went out the window, I don't know. But Deep goes running after him to save him. Hopefully he's okay. I don't think so. But hopefully he'll be okay. And so Archer shows up, of course his other half, you feel what I feel, fills him full of arrows, but with his last reserves of strength, Skekmal gets himself to the door, bleeding profusely at this point, grabs Brea, hops on top of Bennu, and bam, he's back off to the Crystal Castle to deliver a prize. Not the prize he was after in the first place, but Brea, the princess, will certainly do well. And so he's back to the Circle of the Suns, and now the group is in a bit of a panic because they know that they have to go find the dual glaive, but also they have to get Brea out of this situation at the castle, so it's a great little cliffhanger to, to kind of end on. But of course, being the very dark show that Age of Resistance is, you know we had to end with one of the most terrifying sequences in the entire show. We are not Tavra. Love this sequence so much. Of course, we return to Stone in the Wood. We see that Farah is about to lead her assault until she's, she is stopped by the Skeksis. And in particular, Tavra, or at least what appears to be Tavra. And I love this scene, you know, the dark cloaked figure slowly walking down the path with a strobed bright light behind it. And then she comes in and opens the cloak and all the threaders are attached to her body and they fly out of her cloak and they start going across the ground and attaching to people's faces and they're trying to kill them before they attach to their face and completely brainwash them. And I just, you know, it, it's so awesome. It's like a scene straight out of a horror movie. Literally, straight out of a horror movie. And what a fantastic idea, too, to have these creatures that can attach to people's brains and, you know, completely uh, take control of their bodies. It was a really, really fantastic idea and it fits perfectly in this universe. Great directing, awesome cinematography, frightening, zombified gelflings. Damn, I love this show. And in terms of what I relearned watching this episode, this show is awesome! Alright, 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 my friends. Well, that's enough blathering from yours truly for right now. Now comes the best part of the video where I turn it over to all of you. So go ahead and leave all of your thoughts and opinions about Episode 7 down below in the Great White Void. Favorite moments, favorite characters, favorite aspects of the show, favorite scenes. Leave it all down below in the Great White Void. And also, I want to hear about the puppet show, too. I look forward to reading through all of your comments, discussing Dark Crystal with you guys. It's been awesome doing this series so far. It's been great. So... Leave all your thoughts and opinions down below. And of course, as always, until next we meet, guys, take care. For Throp, for Jim, and I'll see you guys back here for the next video on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm doing my videos on Tuesday now. Deal with it.